violating fire code here. I guess you can kind of maybe sit up there up front, um, or you sit on the floor. Uh, right, so a uh, lot to talk about. First of all, we have a DJ again. Uh, give a round of applause for DJ 2PL. All right, you're the fiercest day to day DJ that's not in jail right now. Do you, do you want to do a quick preview? What, what, would you do it, everyone? All right. The other big announcement, too, is that for the first time, we now have two faculty teaching uh, this course. Jagnesh Patel is in the front row here. Uh, just Wisconsin. Uh, we're happy that he's here, so he'll be helping me uh, uh, throughout the semester. Okay, uh, so let's get going. As I posted on Piazza, there's a, another course lecture we already have to get Muchu out of jail of the course. And so we're not going to go over like a bunch of those things all over again. I just want to cover some things that if you might have missed that are important to understand throughout this lecture and then we'll jump right into the material. All right, so the first thing we have a course sponsor, single store, a, a cloud-based database system that supports sort of hybrid workloads, transactions, and analytics. As I said in the first lecture, it is a in-memory column store that uses skip list with just-in-time uh, query. It's distributed shared nothing. If none of that means anything to you right now, that's fine. Things. Um, we'll be coming at the end of the semester to give a guest lecture. That's for a, a, a long time. Um, they originally called it MemSQL, and then they changed the name to Single Store. Um, and so it's a, it's a state of the art database system that's going to cover, that's going to incorporate a lot of the ideas that we'll discuss throughout the semester. The crowd is huge. Obviously, not everyone. Will. So if you're here and you're trying to get the wait list, the bad news is because the wait list is so huge. The department took it away from us, and we have no control over it. They're trying to figure out like who needs to graduate, who has to get the system elective, and all that stuff. Um, so if you come and ask us, hey, can I get off the waitlist? The bad news is that we, we don't control it anymore. Um, the good news is because we have Jignesh now, that we'll be teaching this class once every, every semester. So if you can't get in this semester, uh, you'll be able to get it next semester. And then the admins will move people off the waitlist as, as people drop and as slots become available. Different departments and where departments, things I found out since I became faculty. So again, unfortunately, the bad news is if you're not enrolled now, you're unlikely to get in in the spring. All right, for all this, the the important announcements, everything will be in Piazza uh, Project Zero which we talked about less in the first lecture, that's now available on Gradescope and on the website. The final grades we show through Canvas, um, and everything will be submitted through Gradescope. Again, because people watch th these lectures that aren't at CMU, we're trying to make people outside of, of our university. Um, if you want to test your projects beyond, or in the same way that you, the way CMU students are, there's a separate Gradescope uh, account you can go to using that code there. Um, and you can start them and, and test things out. And we'll release those projects as uh, So in exchange for uh, for people to watch this, in exchange for making this all available to you, uh, we need some. I don't think you have one yet, do you? Mine got banned because there's some shit about there that is sort of true. Uh, <laughs> when they said I was born in the streets of Baltimore. I am from Baltimore. <laughs> Um, so, whatever. And if someone could finish that, that'd be great. Um, and I did write, I commented, hey, I am, I am from Baltimore, just not from the streets. So, I want to cover for logistics. Uh, this is a big class. Obviously, there's a lot of people here that may have different backgrounds. And so, we want you to interrupt us as we're going throughout the semester. And if you have questions about talking about Fine questions. Um, I also get very excited when I talk about databases. Again, my life, wife, biological daughter, number one, is databases and then nothing else. Like, I don't talk about, I have no hobbies. It, it literally is just databases. Can you confirm? It, it is just databases, yes. My parents are Trump supporters. So we don't talk to them. Like, like, it is just databases. So, it's funny to you, right? All right, so again, so it's it, fast, or if you have 
question, interrupt us. What we're not going to do is that at, at the end of the class, have people line up and say, what about slide four, slide five? The material we discuss during the lecture as we go along, because we want you to interrupt as, as, as we're ta talking. Because right? if you have questions, then somebody else is likely to have questions too. It's for us to share these things and discuss it. And from a pedagogical standpoint, it's better for us as well, because I go back and watch and I see where people ask questions, and I see, oh, that's the you didn't get quite right. You go fix the slides. So having the questions uh, uh, is helpful. All right, any questions about these logistics? All right, boom. So let's go right into it. Okay. So we're going to talk about sort of background, what databases are, why it's important, why we need database management systems, why this course exists. Um, not just because we do stupid niche with it's, it's a super important topic. And then we'll talk about, the, in my opinion, the, the dominant model for how you want to build or use in, in a database system. Then we'll talk about relational algebra, the mechanism or the operators we'll use to interact with a, a relational model database. And then we'll finish up because we have to talking about alternative models that people think to, to the relational model. And I have strong opinions of why they're wrong. OK? All right. So, the second most important thing in my life. Um, can I cool. SQL Server. Yes. Yes, the question is if you're on the wait list, can you get access to Piazza? Yes, we'll post the. Now. We'll make that available. Yes. So here's a SQL Server in the back. My SQL. Yes. AnimoDB. One more. Anybody? Cassandra. Cassandra. Okay. Thing everybody's listed: SQL Server, Postgres, Mongo. Those are all database management systems, right? We're talking about databases. And don't feel bad that you're not the only one making this mistake. And this is Jackie. Uh, I think this year. Let's see if it plays. Tech beat for four, please. A relational one of these systems presents the information to be stored and retrieved in rows and columns. Justin. What is a matrix? No. Fuck that guy. All right. <laughs> it, it'll get worse. OK. All right. So database, not, again, I'm being pedantic here, but it's good to understand the distinction between the two. Because uh, when, when we just talk about the data models, you understand, like, OK, we don't care about the system implementations yet about what the data actually is and how we're going to interact with it. So some organized collection of data that's related to each other, that's meant to model some aspect. Everybody lives in database systems. An example of a database, though, would be the university database that keeps track of what students are enrolled in what classes and your grades, right? Because that's trying to model a, you know, the real university interactions that, that, that students are taking classes and getting grades. Um, the, this course is so important because the database, a, or a database, is going to be the fundamental component, the, the underlying of any application or anything you're going to do with the rest of your life. So, no matter like if you're a CS student, no matter if you go off and get a job doing and, and doing CS related things, or you, you don't do, you know, you're not, not a programmer, at the end of the day, you're always going to be interacting with the database, right? Even if, if it's an Excel spreadsheet, database, right? That, is one. Um, and this course is important because, because you're going to end up interacting with database systems, you need to understand what's actually going on the inside. Right? Even if, it, if it's a small application like running on your cell phone or a massive application with terabytes of data, it's important to understand what queries or when you start a database system, what is it actually doing? Right? And, and what are the trade offs you would make for how you use one data model versus another or one database approach versus another? What's the most widely deployed database system in the world? Am I take a guess? Everyone has a cell phone, right? SQLite is on every single cell phone. And it's written by one dude down in North Carolina. But like helper doesn't have an address. He's like a he's like a nomad. Right? So let's look at an example of a database. So we talk about university uh, application. We can talk about uh, something more relevant to everyone here. Uh, same thing like Spotify. Or like Bandcamp or, or iTunes, we're keeping music. So we can create a really simple database that has basically two entities. There's albums and artists appear on albums. 
So the thing we need to store in our data is going to be like, for every single artist, you know, what is their name? What country did they start? And the album could be like, what's the name of the album? When did it come out? What artists appear on it? And so the re what we talk about now, we'll, we'll do a sort of straw man implementation of a database this database. And we'll see why it's stupid, and we see all the problems that it's going to have. And then that, again, that'll help motivate why we actually want to build a full-fledged database system, or rely on a full-fledged database system. So the easiest way to implement a database system that manages data is to just use files on disk. Right? So for every single, for my two entities, I have an album, I have an artist, I have a CSV file, comma separated value file. And every single line in that file, text, every single line, right? Every single time I want to find something in my, I'm going to open it up, you know, uh, parse it, line by line, and try to find the data that I'm, that I'm looking for, right? So say I want to do something with Parses the CSV, magic word parse, basically, you know, it's, it's just splitting on the, com on the commas. And then if I find that the, 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 the name of the article, then I print it out. Right? It works. But this is bad. Why? Yes? It says it's become really, really slow. Those increases. Yeah, so always to think of in extremes in, in, in software. Three records here. Yeah, I, I can load that up in a single page and parse that pretty quickly. But if I have three billion records, then yeah, and if Jizz is the, la the last entry, then I gotta parse every single line by line. Yes, somebody's. Uh, in search She says that the insertion and deletion would be really horrible given the system restrictions. So insertion wouldn't be that bad, right? Because if I just append to the end of it, who cares, right? Right, so she said, what if I want to keep things sorted by release year? Then, yeah, I have to go find where it should be. That would suck, right? You also said update or delete, right? If I want to delete entry, I get the same problem as looking for it. I got to find the thing I'm looking for and delete it. So those are implementation issues, uh, but there's some other problems as well. So your statement is that I'm representing everything as say strings, and then if there's a what, so like a. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So her comment is, I'm storing, uh, I'm storing the years as well. In this case, as text files. So it's ASCII text. But my magic parse function, which I haven't defined, is somehow knowing, oh, this should be an integer, and it's going to call a to i. It's going to cast the the, the var chart into a the string to an integer, and then it's somewhere in the back, it's just a bunch of files on disk. A parsing error. It's corrupt. That's a good one. What are some other problems? Reading and writing to the file is slow. You say reading and writing the file is slow. We, I mean, we sort of covered that, right? Like, if, you, if you're inserting to the end, no big deal. Reading could, could make it slow. Yes. <coughs> well, he said there's, there's the comma in the name might break. The, like, Python packages for C part of that. Yes. Um, you're not able to have, like, concurrent. Yeah, so you said you're not allowed to have current use of the file. Also, writers, things get a little dicey. Yeah. All right. Yeah, perfect. Yes. Yeah. 
of the schema of the, schema of the, the file, the schema of the correlation or, or the database is implicitly and that'll cause problems we'll see in a second. So we covered all of these, right? Uh, so how do we make sure that going back real quickly, right? So I have but I'm going to go fix it. I got to make sure that every single place where I, I have it all gets updated the same. Again, these are just on disk. The, the operating system does, or the file system doesn't know. It just knows that, you know, it, 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 whatever you want to read. Right. So we now in the application to go, we, we make sure all the entries when we make corrections. She brought up the issue of what if someone overwrites a year with invalid string, right? We throw a parsing error. In my example here, I only have, I'm assuming there's a one-on-one -one correspondence between some can only have one artist, but obviously we know that's not the, not the case in a lot of albums. So how do I go change my files now to go uh, account for that? What happens if we delete an artist who has albums? What should happen? Right? Well, in my example here, no, nothing will happen, and now I got a bunch of albums that have an artist name that doesn't map anything to the Right? So the, the, the reference, reference integrity gets broken. We brought up a lot of implementation issues already. Like, how do you find? In my example here, it's it's O N, right? It's a I have to do a, a brute force scan, sequential scan across the entire file to find the thing I'm looking for. Now, in, in, if I assume that there's only one person that you know, only one artist with a given name, then I can stop because I'm done. Artists have the same name all the time. So the albums that I don't know, Jizzo puts out. There's like bootleg jizz in Florida or something like that. I got to keep scanning the entire file. And that's going to be N or the order of N. In my example here, again, I have a little that's, that's operating on the files. Uh, but let's say I want to rewrite it to now run it. I want to write a new application that uses the same database, but I want to write it in Rust because that's the hot thing. So now I got to go make sure that whatever information or implicit scheme I had in my Python code now maps over to my Rust code. But then now if my files change, I've got to make sure I go change both the Python code and the Rust code. Maybe say the guy that wrote the Python code, you know, is in jail, and we can't update it, right? And now what do I do? I'm going to break. Or what if the app is on the same machine where my Python code is running, right? It's running like a microservice on a, on a separate box. How do I get access to that other, how do I get access to that file? And then the is what happens if you have uh, two threads trying to write to the same file at the same time? Well, I mean, you can rely on the operating system to do But again, if I have a billion records and I want to update one of them, do I want to lock a billion, you know, billion records? Just do that one up. I really want to have something more fine-grained that can have multiple threads. And the last one that nobody really brought up was, was uh, how to make sure that our data is safe if there's a crash. Right, file, and then I I crash before I f sync. Some of that data actually might have gotten out the disk. So when my when my my computer, I might see torrents, which is not not what I want, right? Because now I've corrupted data. Or now my data is is, is really big, and I have a, a, a lot of people want to access it. How do I make sure that I can duplicate or replicate across multiple machines so they can all service reads at the same so my application can scale out. Files aren't, aren't going to do that for me. So this is just a, a quick smattering of the management system, right? And why a course like this, in my opinion. So as our management management system is going to be the, the, the software that can allow applications to store and analyze information in a database, and ideally not have to worry about all the things that we just talked about. Now, it's not always been the case. There's going to be trade-offs to uh, the you know, safety guarantees in exchange for performance, right? And a general purpose system can typically allow you to adjust, you know, what the trade-offs actually are. And so a, the, the, the data system is going to define or specify 
inherent in its implementation, how you can go create databases, how you can query them, how you can make changes, you can administer the databases, making making changes and other things. All in sort of correspondence of, of some kind of data model. Well, I'll say also too that this is again, no matter whether you go off and actually build database systems, uh, you know, in, in your day-to-day -day job, this is to be important again, no matter where you go, because at some point you're going to be some, build some application when you have to decide what database management system I want to use. And that should always be sort of the first choice. That like you don't want to do my approach here. It's going to be, uh, have a lot of problems. So I was like, do you think you're like at a startup and you're trying to build an application, a brand new application? The startup doesn't have a lot of money. You're, 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 you're stressed for time to try to get things out the door, to get the first version out the door. Do you really want to be spending your time making sure that your data is safe if there's a crash? Right? Because in the end, that's not a distinguishing feature of your business or your application. Nobody cares that if you crash and lose data, that you, or so you, if you crash, you don't lose data. That's considered like, you know, at this point in, in modern computing systems. And so rather than spending all this time trying to rent your own bespoke database system, you should just use something off the shelf. Chances are it's probably going to be Postgres uh, in, out of 100. That's, what, that's the first choice you should use. Maybe SQLite. Uh, but Postgres will get you pretty, pretty, pretty far. Uh, that I'm talking about here. All right. So again, a data model is going to be again how we're going to represent a entities or a collection of data in, in our database. So, um, all right. So the 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 data model is this high level abstraction specifies how we represent individual entities and potentially their relationship to. And again, we're trying to model some aspect of the real world. Students take classes, students are, are get grades, right? They're in, they're in their home department. And then the schema is going to represent the, the definition or the description of, the, of what these, those entities in our data model of our database look like, right? Student names, students have, have birth dates, have email addresses, and so forth, right? You would specify all of those in our schema, and then we, we would instantiate instances of a database based on a data model according to the, the schema. So there's a bunch of different data models that are out there. So this goes, this goes back to the very beginning of databases. People were sort of realize, oh, we need a is in, is, is in a database. Um, so most database systems today, something that looks a lot like the relational database, relational, relational data model. There's things called object relational, what Postgres is, it just means you can have user-defined types to extend what your relations are, uh, or extend But at a high level, most database systems are going to be relational. I think there's that DB engines, the ranking of the most popular database. I think the four out of the five most popular databases are going to be all relational. Mongo is, is the entire. Then there's a bunch of these other data models uh, that sort of fall under this umbrella term of most people think of NoSQL systems. It's usually the document data model or JSON. One of these. Cassandra essentially become, has become one of these. Um, but there's key value stores, graph databases, and then why families is sort of bastardized. There's array, matrix, and vector data, mo data models. These are primarily used for uh, machine learning or scientific HP applications. I think of like a satellite going around and taking a bunch of photos. You could store that as an array. Um, or tensors to train some kind of model. You would represent that as, as arrays as well. And so there's specialized database systems that can represent, uh, natively represent arrays. And then there's these ones at the end for old people, um, hierarchical network and multi-value. These, these are considered obsolete at this point. Uh, I still make a lot of money to use these. Uh, the hierarchical model is used in IMF, IBM's first database system that they built to have all the parts for, for the, the Apollo in the 1960s. Most, right? Every ATM basically uses, uh, I mean, not, not the box itself, when, when you communicate to the, the bank. A lot of these systems are using IMS. Um, social security, uh, social security 
and, and, and the US government still uses IMF. Anyway, so, so these things exist, but if you're a brand new startup, you're not, you're not gonna say, I'm gonna use IMS or I'm, I'm gonna use IDMS. Like, you'd be insane to do that. But again, not at all, because it, it's not really relevant here. Right, for this course, we really have relational databases and the relational data model. And this is why I was pissed off about the Jeopardy thing, because we go back to it. Justin, the judges have reviewed your response of matrix in the tech beat category, and they have decided that it is correct. We've added $800 to your score, and all of your wagers were made on the adjusted score. There is no such thing as a relational matrix. I sent them an email. They didn't respond. OK. <laughs> anyway, I got a PhD. I think it's in like, neuroscience, but, but like, you know, whatever. All right. So. Hopefully, again, if nothing else at the end of this course, you can answer that question. So let's go back to the 1960s. Uh, and this will, again, motivate why the relational model came about. And it'll set us up for understanding why it's still prevalent and widely used today. And pin it for any new. Back in the 1960s, early 1970s. There, there wasn't a relational model, wasn't a relational database, so there wasn't Postgres, there wasn't MySQL, SQLite, Mongo, right? Early days, the first data systems people were building were not meant really meant to be general purpose, but then they realized, oh, instead of building these bespoke database applications or database systems for just this one application, I can make it a bit more general, and, and now I can support any possible application. So as far as you know, the first database system ever existed but I built by General Electric, then, then sold to, uh, to Honeywell uh, in the 1960s. Well, the IDS they originally built to keep in Seattle. And then they realized, oh, ins instead of building this just for the paper company, we can make some tweaks and then make it so we, a paper company could use it or, or a phone company could use it. And that sort of became the, one of the first general purpose database systems that were ever built. I met the Realized, oh, we could use this for other applications, and they, they, they generalized it. And then Codasil is a standards that was defined in the late 60s, early 70s as a way to, uh, as a standard way to interact with database systems. And people realized instead of having these standard, these, these database systems that, that were being built at the time, we would have a standardized way for how applications less than 5%, or 5 right? Uh, I'm assuming two here is that I heard of Codasil. One. OK. So why? You read in the book. Got it. OK, you read in the book. All right. Yeah. So people Codasil and, and, and these early systems, this is the way you would interact with the database system. And a lot of the things that were in, inherent in these first implementations are things you would not want to do today. And so one of the big things was in these first systems, they had this tight coupling between the logical layer, like the schema, right? you know, what, what, what entities do I have, what are their attributes, and then the physical layer in the system, meaning like how is it actually being represented on disk or in memory, and how would I actually interact with it, right? And so what happened is the, if, you, if you were a programmer at the time and you wanted to use one of these database systems, you had to know exactly how the database system was storing your database, and so that, because that would expose a different API to you for in, to interact with it. Well, on IMS, you could store the data as either as a hash table or a B plus tree or, or tree structure, and then, and then you got different APIs because, you know, depending on which data structure you're using, because hash tables you can't do scans, right? But in in, in tree structures, you so now the problem with this is that any single time I made it want to make a change to the schema, at both the logical layer and the physical layer. I had to go rewrite my application uh, almost from scratch because all how the database was represented on disk changed. There's other issues with the data model. But we don't need to really get basically like in the 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 hierarchical data model. You had to sort of have these for loops traverse you know one collection versus another collection. Right? It was really inefficient the way in, in, inefficient way to interact with the data system. So what happened was in the late 1960s. There was this guy, Ted Codd, who was from Penn, uh, who, who joined the research. And he was walking 
down up in, in, in New York where the big lab is, and he saw all these, these, these IBM developers primarily working on saw them rewriting database applications over and over again every single time there was a schema change, every single time there was a physical layout change, right? And humans were rapidly. So people thought, okay, yeah, we'll just put more humans at, at the problem, and, you know, and not, that's better than buying a... So my example, for, he pointed out, embedded in my name column. Well, think of it now. That was like the ID artist. Now I had to go re the right, That's a trivial example, but that was the kind of shit they were doing back in the day. So Kotz saw all this and said, there's, you know, there's got to be a better way. And he took the model as an abstraction from how, uh, how to represent the, the, a database and the, the relationships between entities in, in, a, in a database. And avoid having the tight coupling between physical layer and, and the logical layer. Meaning, if you define it in mathematical terms, I had these relations, here's the manipulations or changes or lookups I could do on them, and I don't know, don't care how the database system underneath the covers is actually going to store it. Because the database system knows what the data is, knows what the queries are, it can be a better position to decide how to than could. So, I first proposed the, the relational data model in 1989. Uh, there's this, this tech report paper that came out that, and again, he's a mathematician. He didn't define programming language, SQL at the time. He's not saying how you actually implement this. He's just defining what, a relational, what relations are and the algebra to manipulate them. All right? So there's three key tenets of, of the, like, but these are the three ones that we're going to care about the most. Uh, so the first is that we're going to store all our, our collections of data in simple data structures. Relation. I, I, relation, that's the mathematical term. Same thing as a table. If you're coming from the Mongo world, they call it a collection. It's, it's the same idea. All these are simple data structures. Uh, and you worry about all the membership sets that all these other data sets Second is that you're going to keep the physical representation of the database itself, like the actual bits and bytes on disk or in memory. You're going to leave that. You're not going to in your relational data model. Right? Leave that for the data system to figure out what's the best way to do it. Because right? the idea now is like, maybe if I store the database one way, but then as I see what kind of data I'm putting in it, or what kind of query I'm computing, the data system decide, oh, I, I really want to store this on two machines or two files or or break it up in different ways, or, re or sort it in one way. And again, now your application doesn't change because you're just writing things, queries at a high, at a high level, and you don't really care about how things are underneath the covers. Right? And that's the last one here. Like, you're, you're going to define at a high level, you're going to access data through a high level language, and then let the database system figure out what's the best way to, to, to retrieve the data that you're looking for, or to do whatever operation you, you want it to do. So T Cod won the Turing Award for this in 1981. Uh, the guy that invented he won it in like 72, uh, but it took 10 years for people to realize he was wrong. And they the Turing Awards. Um, <laughs> Cod is dead. Uh, the the Cod uh, in the 80s. And then the, the other guy that won the, the, P the Turing Award in David, Jim Gray, he got lost in six. And then the last the P uh, Turing Award in databases is, is Mike Stonebaker, and he's in postgrad. And was my PhD advisor. We'll cover some of So there's three key aspects of the original data model. There's the structure that, that, that there's how we're going to uh, how we define what the data database actually is, what's, what it, what's, what's in our relations, what are their attributes and their types. There's the integrity methods that specify what data is allowed to be stored in the database, right? To make sure that you know every email address. I don't have any records without an email address. Or in my example. I can't have an, an album that, that has an artist that doesn't exist in the artist. Uh, and then the manipulation uh, mechanisms allow us to define how we're going to access the data and, and update it. And this we'll talk about, this last one was what we'll talk about when we, when we start talking about method. An unordered set of, of data that's contained the relationship of attributes that represent some entity in the real world. 
So the relation model doesn't mean the relation between tables. It's really the relationship between attributes within people. So again, a student has an email address. They have a phone number, a, a, a birth date, a home address. Right? It's, it's that relation of those, of those attributes combined together to represent some. some. So again, so we'll have a set of attributes. I'll use the word tuple, but it also can mean record or, or row. Uh, again, at a high level, they all mean the same way, same thing. And so for the uh, for every single value in the original original definition of the relational data model, all the values have to be atomic or scalar. But again, as things have evolved over, over time, and again, COD didn't foresee these things back in the 70s. This is to support this today. And of course, our good friend Paul is going to be there. Uh, so for, we, can, we can, in some cases, a, some attributes could have a value that is null, meaning it's unknown at the time. And again, you can specify in the schema what you want a, an attribute to, to support. So every, in every relation, there's going to be a primary key that's going to be used to uniquely identify a tuple. Again, think of like your student ID, your Android ID here at the university. And that allows us to know exactly, you know, the single record that, that we want, right, when we're doing some jobs. Right, example here, uh, Uh, a particular, you know, particular entry in our database. But again, the and your Android ID is unique, and that, so that would be a primary for, for you know, the university database. What you can do in cases where you don't have good primary um, identity column, the primary key. Uh, you see this a lot in ORMs. If you like Mango, SQLize, if you're using Node.js, a lot of times the, these these frameworks will make these primary keys uh, for you like this, right? And so the primary key is is a, a constraint that the database management system will enforce for you on your relational data. Make sure that within a given relation, there does not exist a multiple records with the same primary key. Talk about how to do uh, automatic identity columns uh, throughout the semester, but there's basically ways data management systems will, will can generate these columns for you. Are called foreign keys, and this is to enforce referential integrity to make sure that, that if I have a, uh, a, a tuple in one relation refers to another tuple in another relation, that the data management system you don't have you know, an orphan or, or, or a broken because you, know, you delete the record from one row, still a dangling pointer in another row. So going back here to our, our database. Here. Uh, in, in this tape. But the problem is, say we have this mixed tape here, right? We have a bunch of artists appear on it. How do we actually? On this mixtape, and I said before the relational data doesn't support arrays, at least the original version of it. So the in the data model to do this, you would have like a cross-reference table, where you can keep track of the, the unique pairs of of the relationships between the artists and the albums. Right? So Right? And now, again, again, it does it for you. So you just write the same delete command, and the key is not all of them. 
for you. My and approach with Python code, I'd have to do all that myself in my application code to follow those pointers to go find the things I'm looking for to make sure that I don't have these uh, these dependencies. The way you do this is. is If, if, if you're going to violate All right, the last constraints you can have are called constraints. Our protection mechanisms, you can have the data system enforced to make sure that data follows the, the proper, has values that, that conform to some kind of domain, uh, or that you, um, you don't have values or tuples that they make as and, and other things. And the idea is that you can specify for for a given attribute, or within the global, within a given attribute or a given table or across multiple tables, I can have it every single time I make a modification, or any of these constraints being violated. If if yes, then I throw an error and I, and I don't let you make make any changes. So again, back to the example she brought up before. Well, what if someone writes a, a string character in the here column for my CSV file? The data system would actually prevent you from doing that if you had these in category constraints because it would know, okay, you're trying to sort something, you're trying to sort a character into a, an integer column. I can't let you do that in a an error. You can do other things like make sure that the, the year has to be greater than 1900 or greater than zero, right? And the data system will enforce that for you. The most common constraints that are out there, are things could happen for you automatically. And doesn't let you make the change. But again, we find this in our schema, and the, and the relational database system will make sure that the get enforced. So now, you know, no matter if you know, Python code, he's in jail, and you have to start making changes. You really know, you know what's going on in the database. The data system will prevent you from shooting yourself in the foot and making changes to these constraints. All right, so now we got to talk about how we actually want to interact with the database, right? Assuming we, we set up the schema, we define what, what our, our database and relations are going to look like, um, we want to talk about how we actually want to, uh, to, to run queries on it. So at a high level, there's two basic approaches to do this. There's the procedural and non-procedural languages. So procedural, the exact you want the data system to do, whatever it is that you want to do. The, the uh, a non procedural one is where you would say, here's the answer I want you to compute. I don't know how to compute it. You figure it out. So, relational and the SQL or relational calculus is going to be uh, non procedural, declarative. We're not going to cover relational calculus because you don't know it. Uh, in, you know, I've never used relational calculus. Have you? Never. Only in the theory papers, which we're not doing. We don't care about those, right? But it is, it is how it's going to work. If you're baby coding a query optimizer, you can relational calculus, but in the real world, but relational algebra is, is not something you don't need to program, but this will be what you want to do uh, to, to run queries and build execution engine, all the things we talk later on. We want to cover relational algebra at a high level, and then next we'll go over sort of the, the crack course. SQL is the modern variance of it. All right, so the uh, relation in 1969, you also define the, the algebra uh, that you would use to interact with the database system. And it's, it's be a way to extract data from it and, um, and per, c compute answers that, that you want. So in the original paper, he defined uh, seven fundamental operators. It's since it's been additional additional operations you need in modern applications, like this doesn't have sorting, uh, and obviously in applications you need sorting, so that came later. But uh, all this is going to be based on, on 
unordered lists of, of, of records or duplicate or unordered list of tuples, uh, but without any duplicates. Now, what's going to be slightly confusing is that in, in SQL, by default, it's going to try to use bag algebra, which is basically an unordered set that does have duplicates, or sometimes it's called, it's called a multi-set. Um, and the reason why SQL wants to use bags instead of sets is because it's actually you can be more efficient if you don't care about removing duplicates later on. But in the algebra that we care about here, we, we assume we're going to get rid of duplicates. So the basic idea of all these operators is that you're going to take in some 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 relation as your input, or one or more relations as your inputs, and then you're, you're going to do some operation on them and then produce a new relation as the output. And you can start chaining all these, uh, these operators together to do more complex things. So we'll go through each of these one by one. Animations aren't working. I don't know why, but that's okay. Um, it's just showing everything all at once. Um, First use as, as select, but I think the original paper calls it restrict. So the idea is the same thing, right? But you're trying to restrict the two predicate. And the idea in your select operator, you're going to define first order predicate logic to specify what tuples will match whatever the select operator uh, is trying to do. It, it, it's like Boolean logic, like it's something equals something or something less than something, but you can have conjunctions, ands, or disjunctions, ors. Predicates down below on whatever your target table is. Next operator is, pro is projection. I'm, I'm not good at Greek symbols. For this one, it's easy to remember because it's a low pi symbol for p for. And the idea here is that as, as your input and specify what you want to be in the output of, or of or the output of the operator. So you can rearrange the out, the ordering of the attributes. You can uh, remove attributes you don't you don't, you don't uh, and then you can manipulate the values of the attributes to to, to generate new derived values. Um, again, but, but it's only operating on whatever that, that that's given to it. To subtract it by by a hundred. All right. So now we talk operators that that take uh, that take multiple relations as their input. So in the in the in the union operator, it's a binary operator. So you're going to operation from set theory. Generate a relation that contains all the tuples that either appear on the one of relations or both of relations. So here, if I take the union clause. So union will get in SQL will we'll get rid of the duplicates. If you want to keep the duplicates and make it run faster. You would, you would add, it's union all, A-L-L. -L. Um, we don't have to worry about that. Just like union, we also have intersection. Same thing. We can take the, uh, take two, two relations and the, uh, have to appear. Uh, difference is, is to take all the two implications and spit out all the ones that appear in the first one, but not the second one. Okay, and in SQL, you would use this with the, the 
this is basic set theory. This is not anything that should be uh, surprising to anyone. So any questions before we move on to, to interesting things? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so he, his question is, uh, thank, you, thank you for bringing this up. The question is, in, in all these examples so far, do the two input relations have to have the exact same schema? Yes. So you see that case too. You see. Yes. All right, so the next, so we're thinking if we start looking at how to combine together the relations and actually potentially look at what's actually in the values of them. So the first one we're going to do is the, the, the product operator, or in SQL it's called the cross line. Um, the idea here is that you're basically going to concatenate the, the, actual, the first relation and the tuple, both, and it's for all unique combinations of tuples from, the, from one relation and the other. So you sort of think of this as like two for loops, right? Where there's four loops spinning over R, for every single in tuple in R, you're going to concatenate it with every single tuple in S. And you put Let me think, I guess, why this is, would actually be useful. Why would you actually want this? Example I can think of like testing, right? If you're trying to find all unique combinations of some like two inputs to test some piece of software or some some some, some something, um, then you, you could use this. But beyond that, I, as far as I know, I, this is not widely used at all. And oftentimes this shows up because you you make a mistake, like you forgot a where clause and and you get this by accident. Or what, one of the tables says what? What do you mean? Sorry. Like uh, in Docker, for instance, one of the table represents. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so it's the same as like an enum table where they're trying to, like, but that's like for inputs, right? They're trying to get all, like, like trying to get all possible enums for, as input to something. All right. The one that's actually super useful um, is to do uh, joins. And the idea here is that when you're going to generate a the the combinations of the two from the two input relations, we'll assume two for net, you know, it's, it's a binary operator. There are multi-way joins where you can take multiple, multiple inputs, multiple relations. We can ignore that for now. You, you want to generate a new closure output that's going to contain all the tuples that match on the, the overlapping attributes in the first relation and the overlapping attributes with the second relation. Right, so different than the, uh, the intersection, because the intersection has to have the exact. In this case here, I don't have to. I want to find the attributes where I, they do overlap, and I, I, I want to check them. And so in, my, in, in, in the original relational algebra here, you would actually, you don't show the duplicate columns, like the AID from R and AID from S. So there's a bunch of different ways to write this in SQL. Um, there's a natural join uh, operator keyword in SQL. Where Or if you want to
um, explicitly like this. That's, that's a good way to do it. it it's gonna make your, it'll make your application look brittle. Yes. The question is, the order and RNS matter in this case? Why would it matter? Again, at this point, a SQL natural drawing. Both of them. Yes. Yes. You mentioned if you add a point of R, like reverse order. So his question is, uh, projection. Other questions? So these are the ones that, that Ted, or the ones that I showed you were the fundamental ones that Ted defined. Um, in the late 1970s, it got extended with a bunch of additional things. And when building real applications, you need more than here in the original relational model, relational algebra. Right, ne renaming is like a projection, assigning values, sorry, assigning attributes to, uh, to, 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 it's important. Duplicate imminent elimination, like distinct clauses, uh, things that, that aggregation, sums, counts, max. We used to teach it. We don't teach it anymore because I, I, you never find it. It's basically a way, division's a way to find, for, find, uh, find the tuple one, one relation that matches all tuples in another relation. Uh, it, it doesn't appear in the real world. It's, like, not, it's not common. We don't we have to worry about it. The bottom line, again, like, the core of every relational database system is to be built on, on, these, on, these, on this algebra, and then we can define a around the, the sort of tools that allow us to support very expressive and very complex uh, SQL queries. Yes? So question is, if, if, so why do we need Um Because you can define duplicate elimination on things with the primary key. Okay. So finish up. 
the uh, relation query um, still sort of the, uh, you know a piece of software that the system to actually execute it very between one order versus another so say I do a where where there's the the SB Two, two, uh, one billion tuples to get billion, uh, one billion tuples together uh, right away, right? So relation algebra, you're still specifying basically how you want the data system to execute things. So a better approach, and this is the motivation for SQL, is that we want to tell the the database system at a high level, here's the answer we want. We don't know how, we don't care how you're actually going to for us, but this is what we want you to do for us. Instead of specifying the exact algebra steps I want to compute it. Hey, retrieve the tuples from, from RNS and find me all the ones where BID. And then now the database system can, can take into account how the data is being stored, what kind of hardware, where things are actually physically located, uh, what the CPU can support, what kind of actually what kind of CPU do I have? Do I have a GPU? Do I have an FPGA? Do I have other things? All of that uh, can be in its decision for how to execute the query, one way versus the other. And now, again, think of like, if I'm a developer, I can write a bunch of code on my laptop, write some SQL on my little test database, and then the same SQL statement will then work exactly the same, or it'll still produce the same correct result when I deploy it in production on a, you know, a, a giant machine that has a, lot of, has a lot of memory. And I don't have to change my application code. So that's the beauty of SQL, that's the beauty of why you're gonna want a declarative language, the, the core concept of how that declarative language is going to work is going to be predicated on relational algebra. Right? So, SQL is going to be the de facto standard, as, as we'll discuss. Okay. All right. Quickly before we go, I want to talk about other data models. So, uh, I and then because vector databases is the hot thing on Hacker News, it's worth discussing what they actually are, so you guys understand why it's all bullshit. We see it in the real world. Okay, so the document data model is old. So MongoDB came out in 2008, and said, oh, this is groundbreaking, we're storing things as JSON. But the ideas go back to the 1980s, early 1990s. There were object data, object-oriented programming was the hot thing. So people said, rather than storing things as relations, we want to store things as, as objects. And then they had these sort of specialized programming languages that knew how to write, uh, write code in, in your objects, like in, in it would, database system. But those, they're basically, those objects are the same thing as JSON. They're the same thing as XML. XML databases were the hot thing in the late 90s, 2000s. So at a, at a high level, all these things are equivalent. So the basic is that if you, it's a hierarchical uh, data structure where you have these named fields, and the values of the named field can be, uh, can be an array, a scalar type, and so forth. And again, all the modern systems use, use JSON. So now the reason why these, these, these document database systems exist is this, this, this problem that calls, comes up called the relational object impedance mismatch. And that, that's the problem of if I break my, my, my data up into these different relations, but I, I write my application code in like Python or whatever in, in objects, now when I want to go retrieve data from the database, I do a bunch of joins, stitch together my 
which is the form that I want to operate it on my application, but the, cause, but the database wants to lay are separate. And so the And I would argue, yeah, for some things, that makes sense. But for other things, it's actually a bad idea because now you're going to have a bunch of duplicate data. You have all the problems we saw before where i got to make sure that uh, if I change, change something that's duplicated in a file I, or in my, in my, in my database, I make the changes all over the place. So if we go back to our example before um, of, the, the, of the, the music. So the high If I have an object that wants to get, for a given artist, here's all the albums that, that, that they appear on. Right? Now, you can do this in a, in a single SQL statement, but you end up with duplicates. It's, it's, it's not perfect, but um, it's, uh, there's ways to get around it. So the, the document database people say, you don't need this guy here. You get rid of this. And if your application code is just and same problem as before, like if I if my artists appearing on the same album. I could have duplicate entries in all their JSON documents. Okay? And if I make updates, I gotta make sure I change, change all of them. So, and so it's natively. Okay. So, the interesting inflection point in the database marketplace where Almost all the, the, the JSON databases that said, we don't want to use SQL, we don't want to use relational data model, a lot of them have basically converged and become more relational-like. Uh, and you can, run, you can write SQL on, on JSON. And so over time, the, like, what we're just seeing is that the, the intellectual difference between document databases and NoSQL databases and relational databases uh, has, has shrunk. And now basically they're all relational databases. Mongo was the last holdout. Mongo added support for SQL in 2021, right? But for years, because we know the founders, they're like, oh, we're never going to support SQL. They do. And then get, they also support, support JSON. So I would go to a document database that is contorting itself, look like a relational database when you just put a database. Postgres. All right. So, they're in the news because obviously ChatGPT is the hot thing, and so the the way to think about this now is like the in, in, when people were building web applications 10, 15 years ago, it, everything was always JSON. Yo, oh, I didn't, therefore I need a JSON database, and that's how the NoSQL systems got started. Now it's like, okay, well I have all this this these, these vectors I'm getting back from 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 my transformer in ChatGPT or whatever I'm using. I need to store that in a database that can natively store vectors. Uh, so I can do, but, and I, I would argue that these systems, they're, basically, they're, they're limited in the functionality, and over time, they're basically going to have to morph to a relational database. So the vector data model, vector is just a array. That, and in, in this approach here with these systems, it's, it's a one-dimensional array of, of floating point numbers. And these systems are neighbor search, either exact or pro approximate, to allow you to do semantic search over your data. So in all my predicates I showed before, it's like AID equals 2, a a AID equals 102, whatever, like exact matches. This, but these vectors allow you to embed somehow magically through, through, through transformers the, a deeper meaning of what your data actually looks like. So you can ask higher level questions like, hey, show me, you know, show me things related to this. Uh, you know, show Instead of doing exact matches for the keyword CMU, I would look, I would, I can learn things like, oh, show me, talk about a university in, in Pittsburgh, Virginia, that was founded by, like, like, you can learn things about, that are implicit in the data, rather than doing exact lookups. Yes? Uh, Professor, then what's the difference between graphing 
graph database and vector database? The question is, what's the difference between graph databases and vector databases? Let's take that one offline. That's different. Okay. But vectors literally are just a one, like one dimensional arrays. Graph databases are storing the relationship between objects, like edges and nodes and things like that. Yeah, so if you're looking one degree from the current node, it sounds like it's similar. The statement is, if you're looking at one degree from the current node, it sounds like it's similar. But like, um, but like the, how do I say this? In a graph database, you're, you're explicitly storing the, that structure, and then you're traversing it to find things that you're looking for. This is like, I'm encoding it as a vector, and I don't know what the vector is actually representing. All right, so pine cone spot hot one, a bunch of ones. Jim gave a talk with us two years ago. Uh, in two weeks. So if you want to learn more about this, check it out. At their core, all these vector databases are just going to be a index that allow you to do nearest neighbor search. Right? So it sort of looks like this. Interpret these, these, these things, right? It's just by numbers. Like the, the deep neural network figured it out. We don't know what it is. as my, my rank order list. That's the core at a super high level of what a vector database is doing. Yes? This question, is this similar to relational calculus? What is? Sorry, what part of this? Wait. I'm just trying to give an example. The thing I care about. So I would argue is you know the core of these vector classes are is just this no right you can do this in a bunch of relational databases they all added this has PG vector, single store, click house, uh, uh, beyond. They all basically support this now. Okay? I just want to expose this to you to see. So, so, databases are ubiquitous. Uh, relational server is going to find the primitives of the process in a relational database system. Uh, and then, relational algebra will be the, the core fundamental to do these interactions. And then that will define how we want to build the component of our system to, to, to run queries. OK? All right, so Wednesday's class will be on, on SQL. Project 0 is out. Please start it now. It's due the 11th. Uh, and then homework 1 will be out. Hit it.
shit is gangsta. Gangsta. Bad boys are gangsta. Y'all ain't nothing but gangsta. Yeah, yeah. Now listen, I'm the poppy with the motherfucking hookup. 28 a gram, depending on if it's cook up. You ain't hit a mob yet? Still got you shook up? I smack you with the bottom of the clip and tell you, look up. Show me where the safe's at before I blow your face back. I got a block on taps, the feds can't trace that. Style is like tamper proof, you can't lace that. The Dominican, or you could call me Dominican. Black skelly, black leather, black suede Timberlands. My all black 38 is send you to the pearly gates. You get consignment trying to skate, and that's your first mistake. I ain't lying for that cake, your fam, I see you wake. My grams is heavyweight, then ran through every state. When they ask me how I'm living, I tell them I'm living great.